I've got a podcast called Rehash. I co-host it with my friend Hannah, and it's all about internet phenomena that get us all up in arms, only to forget about them within a week. So we rehash them, as they say. We just wrapped our fourth season, which is all about schmecks on the internet, the symbiosis of humanity's two most basic instincts, innovation and getting off. We cover everything from Pam and Tommy to Tumblr to Fausta Sesta. Go check it out. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash Chanel. Imagine, you're a little boy. The year is 1996, and your old man just popped a tape into the VHS player. Donnie, it's time to show you my favorite movie. On the screen appears Kevin Costner as Ray Kinsella, a mulleted, middle-aged father walking through his Iowa cornfield. Suddenly, to his surprise, Ray hears a voice that tells him, If you build it, he will come. Without a second guess, he surmises that the voice is telling him to build a baseball field on his fertile farmland, at great financial risk to himself and his family. Since Ray is currently in a place of deep regret about having lost a relationship with his late father, John, a small-time baseball player himself, and not yet having achieved anything of note in his life, he decides to build the field with the support of his wife and daughter, and in doing so, discovers that he summoned the ghosts of several legendary baseball players, including the disgraced shoeless Joe Jackson. Joe Jackson is a contentious figure for Ray, since a disagreement about Joe is what led to his estrangement from his father. Nevertheless, he persists and decides to keep the field with the hopes that it will become a pilgrimage site for all the Americans who wish to relive their childhoods. Near the end of the movie, as Shoeless Joe Jackson and the others disappear back into the corn for the night, a masked catcher appears on the field. Ray is confused at first, but then the catcher reveals himself to be Ray's father. Realizing that the prophecy was referring to John all along, Ray stops him and asks, Dad? You wanna have a catch? The two play the game of catch Ray has so longed for, and we pan out to see the headlights of cars lined up outside the field as far as the eye can see. The screen fades to black, and your old man looks over at you, a single tear rolling down his cheek. Field of Dreams, which came out in 1989 and was directed by Phil Alden Robinson, has long been cited as the movie that'll reduce even the strongest men to tears, what you might even call the quintessential male weepy. And it's no wonder. The past century and a half has not exactly been great for men. Think about it. You're on top of the world. Everyone respects you or is forced to. You're considered a hero, a provider, and a protector. And then all of a sudden, it comes crashing down. Deindustrialization comes and turns many traditionally masculine jobs obsolete. Everybody else starts getting political rights and entering the skilled workforce. Women are allowed to attend the same colleges as you and then slowly begin to surpass you in academic performance, in graduation rates, hell, even in sheer attendance numbers. In 1958, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. warned the masses that the male role has plainly lost its rugged clarity of outline, because the ways by which American men affirm their masculinity are uncertain and obscure. There are multiplying signs indeed that something has gone badly wrong with the American male's conception of himself. And that certainly may be true. It seems that today, men are mired in malaise. As Idris Kaloun recently observed in The New Yorker, Men are increasingly dropping out of work during their prime working years, overdosing, drinking themselves to death, and generally dying earlier, including by suicide. Now, many will attribute the malaise of the contemporary man to toxic masculinity, and the fact that within this paradigm, men are not allowed to cry or talk about their emotions. And that is true in most areas of life. But if there's one area of public life men are allowed to cry, it's the dark, quiet seats of a movie theater. In my May-December video, I talk about the ways that tearjerkers like Stella Dallas commentate on women's socio-political positions by drawing extreme emotions and pathos from the viewer. These movies earned the name tearjerkers for, as scholar Tom Lutz puts it, their ability to make women cry by staging crises of female role performance. Well, with some earlier exceptions, 
As the liberationist 1970s came to a close and we entered the more traditional era of the 80s, a bunch of movies started popping up that seemed tailor-made to make men ball like babies. Movies that can really only be characterized as male weepies. These movies are similar to women's melodramas in their overt sentimentality, exaggerated emotions, and long-suffering protagonists, not unlike Field of Dreams. Again, it's no wonder this movie brings men to tears. In a time when it feels like masculinity is in crisis, a film that strikes at the center of these fears without ridiculing them is sure to get men going. The male weepy is no doubt hyper-masculine. Its protagonists can be stoic, yet prone to volatile outbursts. They're often emotionally hardened and hard-bodied. Their feelings are often externalized through tangible events like sports and war. The male weepy can also be very nostalgic about hyper-masculine eras. Take Field of Dreams. By resurrecting these hardened men from what is regarded by many as a greater time in America's past, it puts on full display a yearning for a time where rugged masculinity was championed. Joe Jackson especially, who was banned from playing baseball after conspiring to fix the World Series, is someone who was emasculated in his lifetime by having his vocation taken away from him. His resurrection in Field of Dreams is an attempt to restore that stolen valor. Getting thrown out of baseball? It was like having part of me amputated. I'd wake up at night with the smell of the ballpark in my nose. This theme is quite prevalent in sports melodramas generally. Like Rocky. Rocky came out over a decade before Field of Dreams, in an era where the shallow foundations of American greatness were beginning to crack. A time that exposed the artifice of democracy, faltering nationalism in lieu of a senseless war, and to top it all off, an economic recession. And so, as Chuck Tryon writes, this political context helped to establish Rocky as inherently nostalgic for a golden age of boxing and of economic opportunity that no longer seemed to exist. An age where, like the grid of old-time baseball players, men could look each other in the eye and go fist to fist. But it's not all about sports. If you want to talk about that whole Roman Empire meme, look no further than Gladiator. If there's any period more strongly defined by rugged masculine valor, it's ancient Rome. A time where men wore armor over their chiseled bodies and proved their strength through head-to-head -head combat as Rome colonized the known world. In Gladiator, we meet our protagonist Maximus in 180 AD at the end of Marcus Aurelius' imperial reign and the beginning of the end for Rome. Maximus is posed against our antagonist Commodus, Marcus Aurelius' conniving son, who's portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix as slender, wet-eyed, and meek next to Russell Crowe's grisly machismo. So it's not hard to read Maximus as an avenging angel for the waning masculinity of Rome. So male weepies allow men to yearn for a long-lost past where brute masculinity was valued and admired. Of course, this comes with its criticisms. Many were quick to point out that Rocky, who's framed as the disenfranchised underdog next to Apollo Creed, an arrogant black boxer with great physical prowess, is a stand-in for the newly insecure white masculinity. It is a coincidence that you're fighting a white man on the most celebrated day in the country's history. Of course, it's widely documented that black working class men were the first to be hit by the effects of deindustrialization, an emasculation that Rocky very much obscures by centering on the economic disenfranchisement of a white Italian man and turning a black boxer into the face of the boxing establishment. Likewise, the choice in Gladiator to insert a situation in which a Roman general escapes execution, becomes enslaved, and then emancipates himself into real Gladiator history, a history where many of these fighters were enslaved people from the very territories that Maximus' army would have colonized, has been called into question. Scholar Martin Fradley argues that the movie represents a significant narrative thrust towards the casually naturalized re-censuring of white masculinity. These criticisms are founded. As men's dissatisfaction with their social standing grows, so too does their resentment. Emboldened by populist politicians and self-help grifters, more and more men of all races, creeds, and classes are joining the manosphere, and the divide between men, white men especially, and the rest of the world feels wider than ever. So a genre of movies that encourages men to cry about their stolen valor can easily appear to perpetuate these sentiments. But critics of the male weepy tend to allude to the notion that 
Because of these hypermasculine and nostalgic qualities, the male weepy perpetuates a retroactive, toxic masculinity. And while the narrative may seem so, critics of the male weepy are not looking into the emotional core of these films. With a closer look, you'll find that beneath its hypermasculine armor, the male weepy's vision of masculinity is less so toxic than it is aspirational. The narrative thrust of Gladiator is an action-filled epic about a man who loses everything and fights his way back to glory. But the emotional thrust is a man trying to keep a promise to an old friend and to his people. Both of these are hypermasculine, but one takes that hypermasculinity and uses it for good. The concept of toxic masculinity was coined in the 1980s by psychologist and leader of the mythopoetic men's movement, Shepard Bliss, and it's used to describe behavior that diminishes women, children, and other men. For Bliss, it's a way to describe that part of the male psyche that is abusive. When masculinity is discussed in mainstream culture, it often appears in this form. In the chauvinism of Andrew Tate, in the paper-thin machismo of Jordan Peterson, in the hateful corners of men's forums online, it's actually so abundant online that a study this year by King's College London found that UK boys and men aged 16 to 29 were more negative about feminism than men over 60. Human beings need codes to live by, and the codes for men are either disappearing or getting more and more warped by the day. But in an incredible essay for The Atlantic, writer Caitlin Flanagan argues that masculinity is not inherently toxic. Instead, she posits an alternative heroic masculinity, which she describes as the opposite of toxic masculinity. It's all around us, she says. You depend on it for your safety, as I do. It is almost entirely taken for granted, even reviled, until trouble comes and it is ungratefully demanded by the very people who usually decry it. Meaning that, as we conflate masculinity with toxicity, we've begun to ignore its virtues. In another Atlantic article, 21 readers of the magazine give their opinions about today's masculinity crisis, and one person, Glenn, argues that boys and men aren't jiving with today's moral culture. He says that there's a difference between being loved and being respected, and that most men, if given the choice, would choose to be respected. The issue, Glenn writes, is that modern culture gives men plenty of opportunities to be loved, but little opportunities to be respected. Give them an opportunity to earn respect and watch them thrive. Respect is not antithetical to love, it is to some extent an expression of love written in a masculine emotional language. And I actually think one place where this pathway for respect and heroic masculinity can be honored is the male weepy. So let's break it down, shall we? A major theme of the male weepy is camaraderie. The emotional core of Maximus' story is the deep friendships he forms throughout his journey. Having already commanded the loyalty of an entire army, Maximus quickly gains the respect and camaraderie of his fellow enslaved people, the most notable being Juba, an African gladiator from Carthage. It's through Juba and the other gladiators' undying loyalty to Maximus that we understand why Marcus Aurelius wanted to make him emperor in the first place. We see it from the moment the film begins, as Maximus walks through his ranks and the camera dances across a sea of smiling faces, all pointed towards their general. Faces that will soon be wiped out in the following battle. You seem upset. I lost many men. And we see it again when Maximus finds himself at the basest level of society, cast among the most disenfranchised lot of the Roman Empire, and is able to form a deeply bonded unit of fellow gladiators who willingly sacrifice themselves for Maximus and his cause, just as the soldiers did. And for many people, the most heart-wrenching scene of the film is not when Maximus dies, but when his friend Juba returns to the Colosseum to bury the figurines of Maximus' wife and son. The film ultimately closes on a note of homosocial love. I will see you again. In an increasingly individualized world, camaraderie and community are becoming harder to come by. 
And when paired with the fact that men often have a difficult time being emotionally vulnerable with one another, it's no surprise that we're hearing about a male loneliness epidemic. Very few of the men in my life will seek their male friends out if they're having an emotional crisis, instead relying on the women they know. They also struggle with making friends, something that already feels impossible to do as an adult. But when they do form friendships, it's often through organized activities, like joining a sports league. All this considered, it's no mistake that male weepies are so often war or sports films. Of course, war with all its death and destruction will never not be sad. But the war films characterized as weepies are ones that place a greater focus on combatant camaraderie. A film like Saving Private Ryan, for example, centers itself on the networks of trust built between a group of soldiers in World War II and their brotherly commitment to risking their lives for a man they never met. War films like Gladiator or Saving Private Ryan, or sports films, for example, place their male characters around a common pursuit or activity that force them to be emotionally vulnerable with each other. In yet another Atlantic article, Peggy Orenstein talks with over 100 American boys aged 16 to 21 about their thoughts on masculinity, love, and friendship. And she finds that when asked what they liked most about being a boy, the most frequent response was sports. When Orenstein speaks to one interviewee, Cole, about his experience rowing crew, she observes, When he raced, he imagined pulling each stroke for the guy in front of him, for the guy behind him, never for himself alone. It's through these goal-oriented scenarios where belonging is built in that emotions are allowed to come through. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. Baseball has marked the time. This game is a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good. It's the ideal setting for a male melodrama. Of course, this can spill over into toxicity as well. As Cole reflects, Crew demands you push yourself to a threshold of pain and keep yourself there, and it's hard to find something to motivate you to do that other than anger and aggression. This is something explored in The Iron Claw, our most recent male weeby. Based on the real horrific story of the Von Erich wrestling family, we see how the sport of wrestling comes naturally to some of the Von Erich brothers and is forced on the others by their domineering father, who pushes them beyond the threshold of their capabilities, resulting in unfathomable tragedy. Here, we see the tenuous relationship between toxic and heroic masculinity, and how easily one can spill into the other. But as this sport destroys their minds and bodies, it's not enough to destroy the unshakable bond between the brothers. The emotional centerpiece of the Iron Claw is when Carrie Von Erich is reunited with his brothers in the afterlife, including the older brother he never met. And again, we end on a note of brotherly love. I used to be a brother. I'm not a brother anymore. Male weepies are stories of perseverance, whether that's through the pursuit of a greater cause or a personal objective. Heroism, a theme that appears quite often in tearjerkers, is defined by a sense of duty, but it can often look different between men and women. In the Heroic Masculinity article, Flanagan describes women's heroism as a form of self-defense, specifically from male violence. The number of women who have risked everything, and in many cases lost their lives in self-defense, is without end. And the number who haven't thought twice about throwing themselves between their children and great threat is all you need to know about female courage and sacrifice. This description fits very well with what we see in Stella Dallas. Women throwing themselves in the line of fire for their children, making sacrifices to shield them from a male-dominated world. But duty also comes up in her description of heroic masculinity, in the sense that heroic masculinity uses men's strength to protect and advocate for others. Heroic masculinity is selfless. As Flanagan writes, on 9-11, 343 New York City firefighters died at ground zero, and there wasn't one of them who didn't know, or at least suspect, that he was climbing to his death. They didn't do it because of a union contract or an employee handbook. They climbed those towers because they knew that it must be written into the American record that heroes were there that day, and that the desperate people inside those buildings had never, not once, been abandoned. Maximus's martyrdom for Rome reflects this idea. Maximus has everything taken away from him, his power, his land, his family, his dignity. 
get through this adversity, he perseveres. Again, when you strip away all the action and bloodshed in Gladiator, you find a simple story about a man's commitment to his friend and a commitment to the people of Rome who will suffer under a weak-minded, self-interested leader. Of course, a significant contributor to men's anxieties is the pressure to be strong for others without having anyone to be strong for you. So perseverance in the male weepy doesn't only have to come through martyrdom. Perseverance also comes in the form of a commitment to oneself, a dream. Rocky and its 2015 spiritual sequel Creed are about this very thing. In this incredible article for the Washington Post, Christine Emba interviews a number of men about their ideal models of masculinity and reports that, in addition to qualities like agency, problem solving, and physical strength, many of them cited a desire for personal mastery. Like many sports melodramas, Rocky is a rags to riches story. Rocky Balboa is a listless 30 year old man who is emasculated by his lower class status. He's a loser who makes his money the wrong way as a leg breaker for a local loan shark. But if he applies himself, he has the potential to take his boxing hobby to the next level and make an honest living. And so when the champion boxer Apollo Creed randomly selects him as an underdog opponent for his next match, Rocky sees this as a chance to prove himself. The iconic training sequence in this film has become synonymous with overcoming odds. And the film is filled with symbolism about the American dream, from Apollo dressing up as Uncle Sam, to the Statue of Liberty ring girl, to imagery of Rocky praying in the toilets before the match. Rocky doesn't win his match with Apollo, but he accomplishes his personal goal of going the distance and proving that I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. Rocky is a classic story and a great film, but what makes Creed more compelling to me is that it complicates this American dream narrative. In the classic story, our protagonist is a nobody plucked out of obscurity to challenge an arrogant opponent. But Adonis is Apollo Creed's illegitimate son, who struggles in his early years in foster homes after his mother passes away, but is taken in as a child by Apollo's widow and then raised comfortably in LA. Adonis is chastised by his opponent Ricky Conlon, who comes from a hard background, for being nothing but a name. This may be true, but from the beginning of Creed to the very end, Adonis is unwavering in his desire to be a great boxer. And despite being beaten down in the match, like Rocky before him, he confesses what kept him standing. I'm not a mistake. This is the moment that makes people cry. This moment of recognition appears in Goodwill Hunting as well. Like Rocky, Goodwill Hunting was written by virtual unknowns, in this case Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who had to fight their way into starring in the film. And it's famous for making men cry. Will is a working class guy from Boston with a troubled upbringing, who just so happens to be a self-taught genius. Will's friend group is present in the film, but like Rocky's friend Polly, they're there to show us what Will or Rocky could be if they didn't surmount their odds. Will's best friend Chucky actually tells him, You know what the best part of my day is? For about 10 seconds from when I pull up to the curb when I get to your door. Because I think maybe I'll get up there and I'll knock on the door and you won't be there. I'm just left. Will's challenge is that he's susceptible to ambivalence. And so what he needs to strive towards is believing that life is worth living, that he's deserving of that life, and unlike his friends, he has the chance to rise above his circumstances. The realization comes during this moment with his therapist, Sean, where Will confesses his feelings of abandonment, and Sean tells him, It's not your fault. I know. No, no, you don't. It's not your fault. Relieving Will of his self-loathing and allowing him to move forward. You don't know about real loss, because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. Something that struck me about Field of Dreams is how single-minded Ray is in his project to build a baseball field. In a more typical story, our protagonist will falter or second-guess themselves, and then have a moment of affirmation that carries them to the end of their goal. But for the most part in Field of Dreams, Ray and his family don't question the prophecy. The film contextualizes the spirituality with the fact that Ray and his wife are former hippies, but Ray's bright-eyed excitement to follow this dream is something you wouldn't often see from a middle-aged Midwestern father, and definitely not in the male protagonist of a sports drama. And when I thought about this a bit more, it made sense to me that Ray is so single-minded. Like I said, at the beginning of this film, he reflects on the feeling that he hasn't yet achieved something great. 
And this is where we get to the next theme of our male weepy, purpose. But you got your whole future ahead of you, mine? Back there, like all them guys on that wall in the back. When we meet Rocky again in Creed, he's an old man. He's been out of the boxing game for some time now, and although he owns his dream restaurant and lives more comfortably than he did in the first film, he's also very lonely. The people close to him, Adrian, Polly, and Apollo, have all passed away, and so when Rocky is diagnosed with cancer midway through the film, he denies treatment because he doesn't feel like he has much to live for. Everything I got is moved on, and I'm here. If I break, if I'm hurt, whatever, I ain't gonna fix it. Why bother? That is, until he's swayed by Adonis. Adonis is like Ray in his single-mindedness, but we never at any point feel like he lacks direction. Remember, the movie is about Adonis, but Rocky is the subject of this franchise. And so this gap in Adonis' character is filled by Rocky. Adonis' goal to prove himself also becomes Rocky's goal, and it gives him purpose. But purpose is actually present in Adonis' arc too. The film places a focus on the concept of a deteriorating body. You know how many times I had to carry your father up these stairs because he couldn't walk? Yes. You want brain damage. Yeah, you do. I got progressive hearing loss. So it's progressive, so eventually... Yeah. Rocky himself has experienced brain damage from boxing. Actually, sports dramas so often center on boxing and wrestling because their deleterious effects make it so that players have a very short shelf life, which gives way to themes of lost glory, potential for a comeback, pushing yourself to your limits. The key difference here is that, unlike the Von Erichs, for example, Adonis is not boxing for anyone but himself. Adonis leaves his cushy, well-paying job to pursue boxing full-time, a decision that's often questioned in the film, and one that we question ourselves as viewers. But his love interest Bianca, who aspires to be a musician despite her progressive hearing loss, answers this question for us. I always knew what happened eventually, so... The plan has always just been to do what I love for as long as I can. Because he's a nobody, Rocky's challenge with his own masculinity is external. He needs to prove to the world that he is not, in fact, a nobody. But because Adonis is already a somebody and is fighting with the ghost of his father, his challenge comes from within. So unlike so many other players, not even the young Rocky, Adonis does not step into the ring for survival. Knowing what this sport could do to his body and his mind, he steps into the ring because it instills within him an internal sense of drive, a need. What I love so much about Creed is how internal its stakes are. When we think about the past decade, as male loneliness and the manosphere have become so prevalent, Creed is a prescient reminder that reckonings with masculinity cannot just come from society. They must also come from within, an inner purpose. You see this guy here staring back at you? Yeah. That's your toughest opponent. I believe that in boxing, and I do believe that in life. This is even more evident in Goodwill Hunting. Will and Rocky, oddly, have the most similarities out of our male weepy protagonists. They're both from working class East Coast cities and working class themselves, and they're both in a period of directionlessness. Rocky, of course, finds boxing, but Goodwill Hunting isn't a sports drama, and instead provides us with a less clear answer. Throughout the film, Will is asked a similar question to one that Adonis is asked about boxing. Why would he ever choose to work in a thankless blue-collar job when he has the opportunity to pursue a better one? His mentor, Professor Gerald Bumbo, is incensed by Will's obvious disregard for his own gift, with Will constantly undermining every interview and therapy session that's offered to him. And yet, when Will meets his therapist, Sean, who himself has never amounted to the heights that his old classmate Gerald had, and who gave up several important years of his life to care for his ailing wife, Will asks Sean if he has any regrets. Here, Sean could be positioned similarly to Rocky and express feelings of defeat, but instead, he tells Will this. Oh, I got regrets, Will, but I don't regret a single day I spent with her. Will has all the smarts you could ever imagine, and yet these skills haven't given him drive. He's already so assured in his own abilities that he doesn't need a training montage. What he needs is someone who loves him unconditionally. Of course, his friends do, but Will needs love and compassion from someone who can meet him on his level. And that person is Skylar. So like Sean, who gave up a chance to see a historic Red Sox game to be able to meet his future wife. Just slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl. 
Will forgoes his job offer to see about a girl. So purpose doesn't have to come from a tangible dream like sports or a job. It can come from something simpler, like Maximus dreaming about his family, like Will reuniting with Skylar. Orenstein points out a fascinating paradox in our social conception of masculinity. If the writing on the wall tells us that men are currently lost, there should be more discussion about where they could go. Orenstein writes, We have to purposely and repeatedly broaden the masculine repertoire for dealing with disappointment, anger, desire. We have to say not just what we don't want from boys, but what we do want from them. Emba also echoes this, and suggests that traditionally masculine qualities should be worked with, not against, but only if they take on a pro-social aim. The male weepy nurtures this aim. Its tears well from a place of belonging and self-assurance. The idea of being found, of finally knowing what to do, how to do it, and most importantly, how to be. I want to be you when I grow up! And so do <laughs> If the male weepy charts out a blueprint for how men could live, it needs to present its viewers with a role model, someone who embodies an aspirational masculinity. What many of these articles and studies about the masculinity crisis point out is that men, especially young men, are sorely lacking in positive role models. A great deal of the Zoomers from that study who expressed negative feelings about feminism also expressed positive feelings about Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson, figures who I call grifters because they make a living stoking the fears of impressionable young men. These are men who embody traits more akin to toxic masculinity. So what are the traits of the role models in male weepies, and by extension, an aspirational masculinity? A role model can, of course, be our protagonist. Like I said, Maximus is the ideal male hero because on top of his inhuman combat skills, he possesses a great deal of compassion and an immutable moral code. But for the most part, it isn't the protagonist of the male weepy who functions as a role model. For most of their films, Will is a pretentious prick, Adonis is quick-tempered and sulky, and young Rocky is, well, he's kind of a weirdo, and a little questionable when it comes to women. No, if the women's tearjerker centers on the undying love between mother and daughter, the male weepy concerns itself with the father figure, or the absence of him. One of the men who spoke to Emba brings this to light. When I talk to my friends, I can literally count on one hand the number of friends I have who have a good relationship with their dad and actually have learned things from him. So the blueprint is literally sketched into the films themselves, as our protagonists start off without a father figure of any kind, and eventually meet the person who can fill this role, giving them, and by extension the viewer, a code to live by. Ray's unconscious feelings of regret about his father are likely what spur these premonitions to build the field. But at the end of the film, when he isn't offered to go into the corn with the baseball players, he realizes that what he needs to do now is not about baseball at all, it's about being a good father to his own child, the father he wishes he had. Creed distinguishes itself from the rest of the Rocky franchise by reorienting its narrative towards the concept of fatherhood and all its attendant baggage. Adonis never met his father Apollo, who died in the ring shortly before Adonis was born. And so throughout his journey, Adonis grapples with the contrasting feelings of reverence and resentment towards Apollo. On the one hand, Apollo was a great boxer who Adonis aspires to be, and on the other, Apollo cheated on his wife with Adonis' mother and could never take part in Adonis' life. So Apollo's absence is filled instead by Rocky, who we've watched throughout this 40-year franchise grow into the man he is today. On top of the physical training, Rocky provides Adonis with advice and guidance, understanding when necessary, and unlike his own mentor Mickey, Women weaken legs encourages Adonis to invite romantic love into his life. Having become estranged from his own son, Rocky understands the crushing weight of living under your father's legacy, so he urges Adonis to forgive Apollo and release himself from the burden of fighting a man who's no longer here to defend himself. Like Ray, Adonis has to make peace with the father he couldn't have. Robin Williams stepped into this father figure role a couple times in his career, in Dead Poets Society, arguably another male weepy, where he plays an English teacher who inspires his students through the unconventional teaching of poetry to put them on a path not only to success, but becoming better men. And then again in Good Will Hunting as Sean. There are many people in Will's life who contribute to his final decision, Chucky, Skyler, but no one has as great an impact on Will as Sean does. 
Will is disaffected by the other therapists he meets in the same way he is with Gerald, because he looks down on them as soft, snooty, privileged men. Sean, however, wins Will over by speaking his language. The wrong f***ing books. One of the right f***ing books, Will. <laughs> He's from the same working-class neighborhood as Will. He lifts. What, you lift? Yeah. What do you bench? 285. What do you bench? And he isn't afraid to challenge Will with physical violence. Something that, of course, could be seen as negative. But as Flanagan points out, toxic and heroic masculinity can easily exist in the same man. There are plenty examples of a bad man who sees something unjust and who suddenly, if only for the minutes it takes to stop another man from harming someone, puts a stop to it. For that tiny stretch of time, he is connected to greatness. While he oversteps when pushed to his limits, in this moment boiling over the edge when Will insults his wife, Sean is, of course, not a bad man. And so in this moment, Will isn't so much impressed by Sean's brute strength as he is by his naked vulnerability. He is flawed and can therefore relate to Will. And for the duration of the movie, he uses these flaws to lay what he's got on the table and break down the walls that Will has built around himself. Like Adonis, Will needs a man in his life who can connect him to greatness. And I don't think he understands the importance of this until he learns why Skylar is able to afford college. My father died when I was 13 and I inherited this money. That I would give it back in a second if it meant I could have one more day with him. But I can't. Even the self-sufficient Maximus finds a father figure in Marcus Aurelius, someone who's not only given him a sense of purpose in appointing him as general, but also a person who serves as a grounding force, whose stoic ideology gives Maximus something to believe in. His death marks not only the upending of Rome, but of Maximus's life. In a pivotal early scene, when Marcus Aurelius tells Commodus about his plan to pass his powers on to Maximus, Commodus tells him, You wrote to me once, listing the four chief virtues, wisdom, justice, fortitude, and temperance. As I read the list, I knew I had none of them. It's through Marcus Aurelius's eyes that we see what makes a fair and benevolent leader, the virtues of a heroic, aspirational masculinity. Like Stella Dallas, these father figures or role models often take risks in order to nurture their surrogate sons. Marcus Aurelius takes a risk, one that costs him his own life, in choosing Maximus as his heir. Sean goes out of his way to stay on as Will's therapist, a job many men decline. And Rocky risks his personal health to train Adonis. The surrounding characters in these movies stand in for the men our protagonists would become if they stay on a certain path, and the men they could be if they choose another. What they could be is embodied in figures who possess the traits of heroic masculinity. As Flanagan cautions, if we don't give these boys positive examples of strength as a virtue, they will look elsewhere. It's me, Will, remember? We went to kindergarten together. <laughs> One man Orenstein interviews, a college sophomore from Chicago, tells her that when his parents divorced, he found that he couldn't cry, despite desperately wanting to. So to make himself cry, he told her that he streamed three movies about the Holocaust in order to get the tears flowing. Orenstein has trouble understanding this, referencing that by way of her gender, she has always had permission to weep. This is why melodrama is so integral to the male weepy. As we saw in the May-December video, melodrama tries to force the unthinkable and repressed into the realm of representation. It places characters in situations that target something buried deep within the viewer and bring that to the fore. And it doesn't even have to be tragic to get there. As I said in that video, we're unsure at the end of Stella Dallas whether or not it's a tragedy. So with melodrama, our tears can mean many, sometimes contrasting things. Many people remember the film as ending with Stella standing behind the fence, crying and rain-soaked as she watches her daughter Laurel get married through a window. But what most don't remember is the shot that comes after, of Stella walking away with a triumphant smile on her face. Stella Dallas is as much about women's ambivalent position under patriarchy and the pathetic nobility of self-sacrifice as it is about the beauty and the strength of the maternal oath. The same goes for the male weepy. The tears come less so from a sadness towards the events than from a feeling of being seen. It's the tears for Adonis's troubled past, as well as his bright future, for the downtrodden everyman in Rocky and the pureness of his delight at having lost a fight. 
for the death of Maximus and the beginnings of what he died for, for Chucky losing his friend and the smile on his face when he does. As Hughes concludes, a good weepy makes you smile through the tears, regardless of gender, genre, or generation. Of course, I'd be remiss not to point out that hyper-masculine films should not be the only outlet for men to cry. There's still a lot of work to be done in the realm of breaking down the artifice of gender roles. A world where we all feel comfortable leaning on each other without having to justify it, forging healthy relationships with our parents and vice versa, and weeping without popping in a VHS tape is a better world indeed. But shunning masculinity entirely is not the best start. So people will see men crying at these movies and assume that they're crying about some lost power, some retroactive nostalgia for a time when men ruled the world. But if we probe a bit deeper and look beyond the surface of a sports film like Rocky, let's say, or the hokey sentimentality of Field of Dreams, we get a better understanding of where those tears are coming from. The former view would look at Goodwill Hunting and only see Will getting into fistfights on the basketball court, or Rocky punching a slab of meat until his hands bleed, or Adonis punching out the headliner of his girlfriend's show, and not everything these moments are couched within. These movies are hyper-masculine, sure, but they're largely positive depictions of masculinity, of men who are providers and protectors, who are goal-oriented, agential, and courageous, who look out for others, for their family, their friends, their brothers in arms, but also know when to rely on others for help. These are men who are respected, but also loved deeply in spite of their flaws. Even nostalgia isn't all bad. Yes, nostalgia can be a distortion of the past, but it's also been found to be a motivating force. Nostalgia for one's best self tends to motivate people to pursue an idealized self in the future. So if men truly are lost, then the male weepy might just provide a roadmap out of the darkness. This video is sponsored by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. It's for lovers of great cinema and those who don't know they love great cinema yet, because the beauty of Mubi is that it exposes you to artful, thought-provoking, and innovative films you would never think to watch. One movie I'm really excited about right now is How to Have Sex, a movie released directed by Molly Manning Walker. It's about three teen best friends who travel to a resort in Greece with the hopes of partying their summer away, but things get a bit too real too quick. How to Have Sex is hands down the most brutally accurate depiction of female adolescence I have ever watched, drawing for us a hyper-realistic portrait of teen rebellion, friendship, and the tenuous lines of consent. Manning Walker's gentle grasp on this coming-of-age story will have you holding your breath and yet somehow laughing in spite of it all. This is one of my favorite movies, and you can find it right now on Mubi. Discover the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash broeydechanel. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash broeydechanel for a whole month of great cinema for free. Special thank you to Syed Hassan, Mel Pertui, Morgan, Cooper Stimson, Nadia C, Nick, Jenny Eller, J. Frost McFinnigan, Gabriel M, The Wiz Daniel, Edward Yu, Andrew Nguyen, Connor O'Keefe, Sharma, Daniel Sardunas, Jenya, Naomi Nakagawa, Scott Barnett, Julia Campana, Alexis, Nafis Bullock, Carrie Gavin, RSS, Fridjof Holstrom, Alex Short, and Kelly Wolf for supporting this channel.